What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekoWatt video. In this video, I'm going to be showing you how to build the best $800 gaming PC build that you can put together in 2022. Featuring NVIDIA's brand new RTX 3050, a budget GPU that you might just be able to buy. With a brand new budget Core i3 in there and a high airflow case, this is going to be a cracking build. I'll be running you through all the components in more detail, showing you how to assemble the system step by step and testing the performance later. So let's dive into it after a quick word from today's video sponsor. eBuyer is your one-stop shop for great deals on technology and gaming hardware here in the UK. If you're looking to build a new PC this year or just supercharge your setup with a new monitor or some peripherals, head over to ebuyer.com and check out their wide range of great deals. What's more, they've also got some great deals on pre-built PCs from AlphaSync, awesome systems that are ready to ship. Check them out at the link in the description below. Let's kick things off by taking a look at the motherboard and the CPU choices to begin with. The Intel Core i3-12100F is a mighty budget chip. With four of Intel's brand new performance cores, all of these being hyper-threaded too, you get a quad-core eight-thread design that ticks plenty of boxes. With the new Intel CPUs, you can also go ahead and pick up a cheaper motherboard and still get support for overclocking. That's right, the Gigabyte B660 DS3H AX is a killer choice, allowing you to overclock your CPU and your memory. Plus, with four RAM DIMM slots for dual channel memory and plenty of upgrades later on, you really can't go too far wrong. There is one killer feature though that sold it for me, and that's the inclusion of Wi Fi, something you guys ask about quite a lot. I do want to point out though, I wonder what Gigabyte were thinking with all of these. Hmm. Hmm. Capture cards. I'm sure it's capture cards or something along those lines. What we're going to do next is install our lovely i3. It's worth noting you can go for an M80X or a full-size ATX version of this board. The price is not too dissimilar though, so I went for the slightly larger version today. We're going to install the CPU into our brand new socket. Now, a word of warning. <coughs> I promise. You have to beat the word because you're just gonna like not like the word. It's genuinely not. But a word of warning: these new sockets seemingly are much more delicate than the last gen, at least as far as the pin goes. Trust me, we've bent a few pins on these new boards, and it's something we've never really done before. So it's just something to keep an eye out for. Line up your triangles on your CPU. Gently pop the socket down, and then the black plastic cover will remove itself. Then secure it down with the arm. A bit more complicated than last gen, and now my black socket cover's actually got stuck. Oh no. This is, this is what I mean, you've got to be careful and every time obviously you unlatch that socket, you do sort of run the risk of deseeding the CPU, bending some pins, all that business. So I'm just going to check, CPU looks good, socket down, arm under. Maybe remove the black plastic cover beforehand, but then that can cause problems, so just be careful is all I would recommend. One advantage of these Intel chips too is the new snazzy included stock coolers, which for this build is going to do a good enough job. Typically, it will have pre-applied thermal paste on this copper plate at the bottom, but because ours is not brand new, I need to drop a dab of our own thermal paste on instead. There we go. About the size of a large grain of rice. Doesn't matter if it looks a bit messy, as long as it works A-OK, -okay, that's enough for us. And then we can simply pop the cooler on top. You just use these push pins and push them in corner by corner. Really, really simple and you can finish things off by plugging up your fan so that it spins all good and well and keeps the CPU nice and chilly. That was much more tricky than I've ever found it before. So just be careful you're installing this cooler. Once it's in, you should see all the pins actually kind of pop through and split out behind the holes, which will keep it in place. And you can see here, if one of them moves like that, it's not installed properly. We need to go back and do that one again. And there you go, that is now in. So it can be a little bit tentative. It can be a bit fiddly. Take your time and make sure you get it right. Because otherwise your CPU is not gonna stay very cool at all. There we go, plug the cable up, try and kind of manage that in some way. And that's basically it. While we're dealing with the motherboard out of the case, it's also a good time to install your RAM or memory. In this build, I've picked up a 16 gigabyte kit of Corsair's Vengeance RGB. This is the Pro SL version, so it's slightly lower profile, but there's lots of different flavors available, which you can find linked in the description below. This motherboard, as I say, has four RAM DIMM slots, great for not only overclocking your memory, but also upgrades and dual channel performance later down the line. To install it, you wanna find the gold strip and then match the notch on the DIMM, 
with the notch on the motherboard. Don't be fooled, it actually isn't completely central. It's slightly off center, meaning it will only go in one way round. Let me demonstrate. That one clips in nice and easily. Let's try and pop this in the wrong way round. The notch doesn't line up and it won't install. Flip your dim, slide it into place, a little something like so, and then it will go in no problems at all. Right, so there's one more thing we do need to install though before we finish up the motherboard and take a look at the case and GPU a little bit later. And that is of course our storage. This right here is Seagate's Barracuda 510. It's a one terabyte drive with speeds in the region of three gigabytes a second. Truth be told, any decent Gem 3 NVMe is what I'd suggest. Gem 4 drives are just still a little bit too spenny. They're too expensive right now. So this is gonna be a nice middle ground. For this stage of the build, you'll want to throw out your large full-size screwdriver and pick up one of these, a much smaller version, as we'll need this to secure the M.2 drive into place. You can see it installed with this gold notch here, and it only goes in one way round. Once again, like many of our other components, it's actually notched. Slide it into your top NVMe slot at sort of a 45 degree angle, and then drop the drive into place. Use one of the teeny tiny M.2 screws to secure it down, and that's it. Data, power, all in that one easy and sleek connection. And plus with extra M.2 slots, you've got plenty of upgrade room for later on too. With the motherboard assembly now basically finished, we can move on to the case or the chassis. And believe it or not, this box isn't empty. Properly strong over here. Now this is Cougar's MX430 Air. It's a cheap full-size ATX case that has plenty of fans, plenty of airflow, and some pretty good GPU clearance too. For a full-size ATX chassis, this thing is like remarkably small, but I'm not complaining. What we're gonna do is we're gonna lay the case down flat on the table like so. And what we're gonna do is use these lovely thumb screws here to take off our glass side panel. That's going to reveal the motherboard tray when I can actually get it. How on earth? Probably not a great thing to do for the sanity of the glass, but I mean, it works and our panel is off and we're going to flip the case around. That was noisy. So we can get a better look at the motherboard tray. Before we go too gunko and screw the motherboard in, we just need to pop the rear IO shield in first. It's this metal plate and the audio ports, those on the right hand side, need to go towards the bottom end of the case. We're gonna line it up with the rear kind of cutout on the chassis itself and then use a little bit of firepower to click it in. Just be careful because these things can cut your hands. They've cut mine on a number of occasions. Now what we need to do next is we need to grab the motherboard and we need to locate each of the holes on the board itself. These are the holes we'll be using to secure it into place and consist of three across the bottom, a further three along the middle, one, two, three, and a further three across the top. Don't be mistaken, this hole and this hole are for a completely different purpose. I'm actually not too sure what they're for, but they're not what we need. These should then correspond with the standoffs installed in the case. You can see we've got three at the top. They look A-OK -okay to me. Three across the middle, once again, pretty good, and then Oh, couple along the bottom are in the wrong place. So this one and this one need to move down to here and here. I'll indicate this on your screen now with some fancy graphics, but remember, you don't want any extra standoffs that aren't being used. If they're not being used, they're gonna cause damage to the bottom of your motherboard, potentially short things out and lead to a whole world of pain. Don't do it. Then you can slide the board in, screw it into place. It really is nice and simple. With nine screws, three along the top, three across the bottom and three along the middle. I do sound like a broken record record going round and round and round and round. But it's in, and that's the important thing. I want to see my face on a record going round and round and round. For the next stage of proceedings, we could go all gung-ho, get the graphics card in and get all excited. But before we do that, I want to deal with some of the cables and wiring. Specifically, that involves plugging in our front panel connections. On this case, you can see we've got USB 3, USB 2, audio, RGB, power and reset. Let's keep things simple and start off with the HD audio first of all. This goes to the bottom left of the motherboard, has a pin missing, is quite delicate, and will only go in one way around. Once you've done that, we can move on to the USB 2 connection. It looks basically identical to HD audio, but has a different pin blocked out. Take a look at this side-by-side -side comparison. We can then move on to USB 3, the largest of our front panel connectors today. This one is notched, and once again, only goes in one way round. It's a more of a bulky cable, so it can be a bit tricky to cable manage, but just take your time. Finally, the last one is our JFP1 connections. These are all of our fiddly front panel, power, reset, hard drive indicator LED. They're individual pins and I'll plop a diagram on your screen that details which pins are which. If you get these wrong, don't panic. Nothing will explode, nothing will break. It just might not turn on first time and you'll have to go back 
and check your work in. Once you've done that, we can then move on to the GPU. This choice in particular is the Gigabyte Eagle 3050, a card that I've been so incredibly excited to get hands on with. Now, to be clear, we've got a lot of game time with the 3050 as a card already. Asus very kindly sent out their Strix model, and we've got like more than half a million views on that content. But the Eagle card from Gigabyte is a cheaper SKU, closer to MSRP. Now, I know what you're thinking, James, MSRP 2022, you're a funny guy. Here in the UK, that's becoming more and more of a reality. Check out this, eBuyer selling a 3050 for 349 at the time of filming. Prices are coming down and it feels like they're not gonna stop. I've spoken to a few people in the industry over the last week who think in the UK, we could be back close to MSRP within six to eight weeks. Wow, I'm gonna make a detailed video talking about this in more detail, but it's impressive and it's exciting. And the 3050 finally makes an $800 build possible in 2022. And it makes it possible without a huge compromise. 1080p gaming, high settings pretty much across the board and 60 frames per second, near on guaranteed. That's what you're paying for with the 3050. And this gigabyte card is a perfect, perfect way to approach it. What we're going to do then is we're going to line, oops, that was loud. We're going to line our graphics card over the top gray slot. And that shows us we need to snap out the second and third lanes. Now, unfortunately, in this case, they're not reusable, the PCI covers. You kind of have to give them a wiggle and snap them out yourself. One downside it does mean, though, is because I've used the case before, and in that instance, I need to use the first and second rather than second and third, I've now got a gaping hole that I just can't seem to fill. And that's really a bit of a shame. What we can do, though, is clip the GPU into place and we'll fasten it down with a screw on the rear, just about here. That will stop the GPU from sagging. And because this card is just so light, we shouldn't have any major problems in that department anyway. And then once you've done that, we can move on to the final stage of the build. That's after our case has finished destroying my table. Take a look at that. I mean, every I've just cleaned this. If I put the case back down, I literally drop it. I've not even dragged it, I've not moved it. Pick it up, look. It's like a stamp. Six hours later. Much, much, much later. Do you reckon it works on skip? Do it work? Do it work? No, it didn't work. Only works on tables, thankfully. But I mean, look at that. It's ridiculous. Please clean that again. To install the power supply, we're just gonna spin our case around to the rear, and that's gonna give us easy access to the rear panel and some of these cables, which we'll go ahead and tidy up later. As far as the power supply choice goes, I've gone for Corner Master's MWE650 Gold, a unit that makes the most sense because it gives us enough wattage for this build. It also gives us plenty of cables with great future upgrade options and it's 80 plus gold certified, making it super efficient. There's a variety of different cables that need plugging up. These include the motherboard power connection, the largest power cable of the bunch, a SATA power cable, which would typically power hard drives and older SSDs. But for us, we'll be powering up any RGB fans or RGB hubs in the case. You also want to grab yourself one of these, a PCIe power connection with six plus two pins. And then finally, a four plus four pin CPU power cable. This will give our processor power and I'll walk you through installing each of these in just a moment. First, we need to actually plug them up to the power supply, then slide the PSU into the rear of the case with a fan down or fan up orientation. Today, there's airflow on both sides. So just pick the best option for you. To plug those cables into the right places, let's start at the top and work our way down with the CPU power connection. This goes to the top left of the motherboard. The motherboard's main power connector is next. It's 24 pins, 12 tall and two pins wide and goes to the far right hand side of the board. We're also going to pop in a GPU power connector, just a single six plus two pins, so eight pins for our GPU today. Remember to do the six plus two and not the four plus four of the CPU. It's the same number of pins, but they're different and deliver different amounts of power. Then finally, you want a set of power connection for your RGB and that's pretty much it. We can go ahead straight away and boot the PC up for the first time. I'll be looking at the performance in just a moment, but first we need to see how good it all looks in the only way we know how with an epic glam montage i'll see you in a sec but first roll that montage With 
this budget powerhouse looking good, all powered up, it's time to see if the performance matches up. Here you'll find some great results, and on your screen now is a summary of all the tests we ran with our Humble 3050. In fact, you can find the full unedited gaming benchmark runs with the 3050 for all titles linked in the description below. Really is worth a look if you're serious about putting this build together. I am going to take you through some of the titles in more detail though. Starting with an oldie but a goldie, it's GTA 5. Now this is a great game to test out because it has a benchmark mode, meaning you can plug in the same settings we have and then see what mileage you can achieve with your current spec system. Here we pulled in 157 frames per second on average with strong 90 and 99th percentile results. The closer the 90 and 99ths are to the average frame rate, the more consistency we have in the frame rate and the higher the frame rate overall, you'll really notice the difference here. It's a similarly positive story in Battlefield 2042 where at 1080p high settings, with NVIDIA's groundbreaking DLSS 2.0 enabled, we pulled in 97 FPS. This is a 20 frames per second or so difference to with DLSS disabled, and shows the power the 3050 has, especially compared to AMD's new 6500 XT. Moving on to Call of Duty Vanguard, of course the latest COD out, and at 1080p high settings once again, the results were really solid. DLSS enabled gave us 136 FPS on average. This was around 42 frames per second more than without DLSS, and visually, I think the game still looks great. The 3050 is perfect for 1080p gaming, high settings, and still pulling in 60 FPS across the board. That's something that's ever more evident in Forza Horizon 5, where at 1080p ultra settings, we pulled in 66 FPS on average. Now you might think this is a little low, and I wouldn't necessarily disagree with you, although racing games are less reliant on those super high frame rates. Changing from the Ultra preset though to the high preset increased our frame rate by nearly 30 FPS, giving us 94, a number that will be much closer to some people's hopes and dreams than a humble 66 frames per second. Next up is Apex Legends, more of an esports first person shooter title, 1080p high in this game, yielded 106 FPS. Once again, nothing that's going to break your 165 hertz monitor, but still plenty high enough. And remember, this is high settings, so you can tune down anti-aliasing or textures if you're really after a higher frame rate without spending any more money. What about a game like Valorant though, a title that we know will run well, but just how well? Well, <laughs> a lot, all the wows, uh, 450 frames per second is exactly how well. Uh, this is a great title for those of you looking to saturate high frame rate gaming. Perfect esports style setup here and the 3050 delivers. Finally, to wrap things up, we're also going to test out Fortnite at 1080p competitive settings. Everything tuned down to low, but the render distance set to far to maximize your competitive nature when playing and try and give you that upper hand. NVIDIA Reflex and NVIDIA DLSS enabled to get the best performance possible, and we pulled in 188 frames per second. Oh my goodness. An insane frame rate here in a game that performs very, very well on this, what is admittedly a great budget oriented system. And with that, that pretty much wraps it up for this one. If you enjoyed it, make sure to give it a big old like rating, get subscribed. Thanks for tuning in. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.